My name is Tom Grafton. I'm a senior meteorologist here in, in Grand Forks. And our MIC asked, asked if I wanted to um, present in the science sharing um, series uh, that Central Region holds. And I said, sure. It's not my research. Um, what I did is I coded uh, for GFE to, to, to bring this into GFE, uh, this blowing snow model. Here's the reference that the that the model is based off of. Uh, the main author is David Bagley. He is a uh, meteorologist up at the uh, Prairie and Arctic Star Prediction Center uh, in Winnipeg, Canada. And twice a year, what what the Canadians do is they hold a um, change of seasons workshop that runs all day. And a couple of years ago, I guess I was lucky enough, or you know, we had money and. And I was lucky enough to travel up there for their winter change of season workshop. And, and this is one of the uh, presentations uh, that he gave that day. And I thought it could be one of the, I guess, better approaches to uh, forecasting blowing snow that I heard of. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of blowing snow research out there, maybe not enough, but there is quite a bit. And, um, you know, it's an empirical blowing snow forecast technique which sometimes makes me cringe when I see empirical, but um, I think I think this has some application, I guess, at least as a tool to, to give us some better confidence in, in trying to forecast blowing snow that will at least significantly reduce visibility that will have a, an impact on, on the public and travel and transportation. So, I guess I'm going to go over a little bit, kind of a brief literature review. Like I said, it's not really my research, so I'll try to fumble through um, the, the science part of it until we get to the GFE model part. Um, but hopefully, I think I understand a majority of of the science here. Uh, so why is why is this tool be important? Well, predicting blowing snow it has its complexities. Um, some of the complexities are related to the, the state of the snowpack and, and the interaction of the snowpack with the lower atmosphere. And blowing snow varies spatially and temporarily um, due to differences in wind speed, air temperature, and, and characteristics of the snow. Um, and those, those three uh, differences, the wind speed, air temperature, and characteristics of the snow are are what most of the variation in blowing snow is due to. And, and you know, the combination, trying to figure out what combination of, of those three factors uh, sometimes can be difficult. We have a pretty good idea of, you know, while the snow is fluffy outside and the winds are going to be strong, uh, the air temperature is cold, there's going to be blowing snow. But to know exactly, you know, how much the visibility is going to be reduced based on those environmental parameters, uh, sometimes can be tricky. Some of these slides are stolen from David Bagley's presentation, and those will be the ones in this light blue color. I did get permission, so um, you can't uh, can't strike me for that. Uh, so some typical blowing snow forecast forecast techniques that we use. Um, you know, a big one is that magic wind threshold. Our our blowing snow advisories, winter weather advisories for blowing snow basically say 25 miles per hour. Our blizzard warnings say 35 miles per hour. Um, but we know that we can get blizzards at slightly less wind speed than well, as well. And we know that we can get, you know, blowing snow that has some impact on travel at, at less than 25 miles per hour as well. Um, and there's pattern recogni recognition, um, case studies, climatology. And one that um, this research brings in is the wind temperature and snow, snow age um, milligrams. And, you know, if the forecast will always tell you can't just use one of these techniques, you most likely need to use all these techniques in, in somewhat combination. Um, so for the brief literature review, uh, basically what the paper states is, or, or what it does, is it creates a series of charts that summarize the proportion of times where the combinations of wind speed temperature and snow age give uh, blowing snow visibility reductions of a given threshold. And, and what this model is going to do is um, it's going to give the probability uh, that the visibility due to blowing snow will be a half mile or less. 
It's not going to give you a deterministic answer. It's going to give you um, a statistical likelihood. Uh, so it's going to say blowing snow um, visibility at a half mile less due to blowing snow will be 25% likely, and so on and so forth. So a lot of statistics um, up to 40 years um, from 15 prairie and 17 Arctic stations in Canada were used. Lots of hourly observations. Lots of observations with snow and blowing snow, and also lots of observations with just blowing snow without any concurrent falling snow. In the prairie, uh, two thirds of the blowing snow observations occurred with falling snow, and in, in the Arctic, uh, it was the other way around where most of the observations occurred without falling snow. <clears throat> Here's, hopefully, I'm not going too fast. If I'm going too fast, just let me know if the bandwidth isn't keeping up here. But uh, right now, you should have a picture of all of the uh, observation sites in Canada that were used in this research. And you can see all the prairie and, and Arctic observation sites. Next slide should say analysis method on top. So all of the observations were tested together with falling snow. Uh, without falling snow, and they were been, to, been together according to uh, visibility, um, according to temperature and wind speed, uh, using current temperature as well as highest temperature since last snowfall, and then with and without falling snow. And the observations uh, that were analyzed without falling snow were then um, grouped into um, categories of age since last snowfall. And those categories were, <clears throat> I guess, more abundant closer to the last snowfall. So for example, the categories were one to two hours since last snowfall, two to four hours since last snowfall, uh, four to eight hours since last snowfall. And the time ranges um, kept increasing um, away from uh, the fresh snowfall. Uh, positive events were factored with null events. and if uh, melt or freeze occurred uh, since the last snowfall, the observations were eliminated uh, from, from this research. From here, a, a credibility quantity was defined, and you can see the, <coughs> see the formula there. And what the credibility gives you um, is a number between 0 and 1. So for similar environmental um, conditions, this credibility was calculated. So obviously, if you come up with a zero under those environmental conditions, you're going to not have any blowing snow, uh, reducing visibility. If you come up with a one, every time you have those environmental conditions, you will receive blowing snow. Anything in the middle, so you get 0 0.5, you know, 50% of the time, given those environmental conditions, you will um, get blowing snow to reduce your visibility to that given threshold. Uh, this was calculated for every wind speed from 0 to 40 meters per second, and then for every temperature from plus 4 Celsius to minus 40 degrees Celsius. And as indicated before, they were calculated for incidences with falling snow and also without falling snow, and then for certain time ranges since the last snowfall. From here, <coughs> A mean and variance um, was calculated from a probabilistic function of wind speed uh, at each temperature. Uh, the frequency of blowing snow at a given temperature and snowpack age has a cumulative normal probabilistic distribution, and thus this credibility uh, could be treated similar and, and the mean and variance calculated from a probabilistic function, which I do not show that probabilistic function here in the presentation, but it is in the, is in the paper. Um, then critical wind speeds at the uh, 5, 50, and 95 percent credibility level levels uh, were computed at each temperature using the best mean and variance. And from here, these critical wind speeds were replotted over the range of tested temperatures. So this represents a historical correlation. Uh, but in essence, can also be used uh, for predicting upcoming blowing snow events um, using these normal 
programs uh, that were calculated. So next slide, uh, you should have a sample blowing snow probability nomogram. And you may notice Celsius, I think, is spelled wrong. <laughs> um, but I could not go and fix it, so excuse the error for that. Um, so what this shows here is uh, temperature on the x-axis, mean wind on the y-axis. The bottom black line would be that 5% credibility. The top black line would be that 95% uh, credibility line. So anything, so let's say, for example, uh, your temperature is minus 15 degrees Celsius. Any wind speed then below, say, about 6 meters per second, you can expect that you will never get blowing snow. Any wind speed then above about 15 or 16 meters per second, uh, you can assume that you always get blowing snow. And any wind speed in between uh, those two values or those two thresholds, there's a possibility of blowing snow with the possibility increasing or the statistical likelihood increasing as your wind speed um, increases from 6 to 15 uh, meters per second. So here's some simple or simple uh, sample forecast guidance uh, that you know that we use in the model. Uh, so here's a bunch of nomograms. Uh, one, you know, here's a blowing snow threshold without concurrent falling snow, but for eight plus stale snowpack. And a bunch of these nomograms then can be created for uh, different situations. And kind of scroll through these. And the last one then would be blowing snow with uh, precipitating snow. The next slide you should see something that resembles moss guidance. In Canada they do not do uh, aerial forecasting uh, such that we do in GFB where we forecast for entire area. What they do is point forecasting. They'll forecast for different points and put their forecast out that way. Uh, so in that way, uh, MOS type guidance is, is sufficient for them, where it's likely not too sufficient for us because we do do more of the aerial type forecasting, um, drawing our weather grids in GSE. So what one, one, which one wind speed is your blowing snow threshold? And that's kind of the um, tough thing with this with this type of, of model that, that is created because you know for sure you're not going to get blowing snow below that 5% credibility line. You know for sure you are going to get blowing snow above the 95% credibility line. But what if you're somewhere in between where it's possible? Um, and, and we'll get to more of that later, uh, some tips that, that they vaguely gave me. Uh, but at least it is a tool where if you're above that 5% um, credibility, uh, threshold, wind threshold, you know that blowing snow will be possible and it's something to consider uh, more in depth. Next slide, just to show um, some examples of the um, nomograms that are used in the model. And it should say on top, wind threshold varies with the temperature and age of the snow. And what you should see are the, the different 5% credibility lines um, for a one for blowing snow to reduce your visibility to one kilometer or less, and and I guess a few things to notice on this slide. Um, one, it takes far less wind speed to re, to reduce your visibility to a half or to one kilometer or less with with precipitating snow, and then the rest of the lines above are are based on age since last snowfall. So let's take these warmer temperatures, for example. As your snowpack is ages, so as you have an older snowpack, it's going to take uh, stronger wind speeds to generate blowing snow enough to, to lower your visibility to that one kilometer threshold. Also notice that as your temperature gets, gets colder, it, is going to require, it does require less wind speed. Um, to produce blowing snow to your given visibility threshold. One thing I found 
interesting is as you get to very, very cold temperatures, it, it's kind of a, a reverse trend where it, it takes a greater wind speed um, to produce that blowing snow down visibility down to that given threshold. So just a few interesting uh, tidbits to take out of other nomograms that, that are created here. So next slide, uh, getting more into what the model does in GFE then. So taking uh, the research from Dave Bagley's paper and then uh, what I did is I, I did all the coding for GFE uh, basically to, to make the model. So the model is going to calculate the probability that the visibility from blowing snow or snow and blowing snow uh, will be a half mile or less. Uh, that's the lowest visibility threshold that that he calculated uh, is that 0.8 uh, kilometer visibility threshold. So in our model, um, it will be a half mile or less. He, they, Canada has just um, this last winter lowered their blizzard criteria to a quarter mile or what's equivalent to us to a quarter mile, uh, but he has not had the time yet to to make or to do any additional research to, to gather um, additional observations and such. He hopes to do that, but really um, the wind speeds aren't going to be too much different between a quarter mile and half mile, maybe a knot or two. We have it set up here to run automatically every time we send our database to NDSD, uh, but we also have an option that, that it can run manually via procedure. And if you run it out to, say, 72 hours, it takes maybe a couple minutes to run. So what does the model output? Well, there's a few outputs here. Uh, the first one there, that BLSN, uh, VISB, half statute mile probability, so blowing snow visibility, uh, half statute mile probability. That's going to be the probability given by the model that the visibility from blowing snow and falling snow uh, will be a half mile or less. And that will vary from obviously 0 to 100 percent. So anytime uh, your wind threshold is below that 5 percent credibility quantity, it will get 0 percent. Anytime your wind threshold is above the 95 percent uh, credibility, uh, your probability will be 100 percent and then anywhere between 1 and 99 percent between uh, those two wind thresholds. So the half step to mile wind threshold 5 will be your 5 percent credibility quantity. This can also be looked at as the wind speed that could reduce your visibility to half mile or less within blowing snow and falling snow. And obviously if you don't have any falling snow in your forecast at the time, it will be just from blowing snow. Likewise, half statue mile wind threshold 95 will be your 95 percent credibility, and this will be the wind speed that will reduce your visibility to a half mile or less. Also outputted is snow age, uh, so you can see what the model is using for your current um, snowpack snow age. And then this snow or VSBY SN is the is if you have snow on the forecast, it will tell you. Um, the visibility expected from just the falling snow. Uh, right now in GFC, we obviously forecast snow amount in six hour increments. So in order to come up with the visibility expected from the falling snow, what we had to do is um, basically divide the snowfall by six to get an hourly rate. And, and from that hourly rate, it's going to uh, calculate the visibility in snow. So obviously if all of your snow is going to occur in the first hour of your six hour grid, um, you can expect the real life snow visib visibility from falling snow to be significantly less than what is in the, in the output from the, this model. Also outputted from this model, um, I have some no snow um, thresh wind thresholds and probabilities. Uh, so this Basically, take, if you do have falling snow in the forecast, it's going to take out um, the reduction in visibility due to that falling snow and only give you the probabilities um, that 
are possible from blowing snow. Um, so in a way, if you're getting 100% probabilities um, from the snow and falling snow uh, output, and this is 0%, you can assume then that um, all of your visibility reductions are going to be just from falling snow, and once that snow ends, there's not going to be any additional uh, blowing snow um, problems. So that snow, snow, blowing snow, half set amount of probability, then will be just the probability that the visibility from only blowing snow will be a half mile or less. And likewise, there are your 5% and 95% credibility uh, wind thresholds um, from just blowing snow. So using all those model outputs together, I think, um, will give you a, at least a decent idea um, of how significant your blowing snow threat will be. Uh, one word on falling snow, and some of this I think I've touched on already, uh, but if the visibility from falling snow is, is expected to be less than a half mile, uh, the model is going to give you a 100% probability. And you know, by viewing all the wind thresholds together, um, and not just the probabilities, but viewing all of the output together, uh, will give you a better understanding of your blowing snow potential. Uh, next slide should say falling snow versus no falling snow on top. And just a, a word about falling snow versus no falling snow in the model. Um, from what we saw in the, the, the nomogram, um, obviously less wind is going to be required to reduce your visibility at when snow is falling. Um, and the model does take this into account. And then when there's no falling snow, um, the different nomograms for increasing snow age are uh, listed there uh, as well. So those will be the, the snow, the different nomograms uh, that are used in the model. So I'm just going to go through a, a couple brief examples here of, on, on what it looks like in GFE. So right now you should have a screen that resembles uh, a GFE. And then what we did is we set up a weather element group. Uh, so under weather element, uh, weather element groups, um, we have a blowing snow probability half statute mile. And once you bring up that weather element group, uh, right now your slide should have an orange GFE uh, with temperature highlighted on the top and then all the model output uh, underneath that. So in the first example, our temperature is going to range from somewhere in the teens across the north to around 30 across our southeast forecast area. The winds will range from around 29 knots or so across our northern forecast area to around 34 knots across the southern forecast area. And our snow will be light to moderate, where across the north we're expecting about an inch in the six hour period, and across the south about three inches in the six hour period. So the <laughs> excuse me, uh, the output that the model then will give for this particular hour, um, the visibility from just the falling snow then will be will be about a half a mile across the southern forecast area and oh upward to about a mile and a third across the, the northern forecast area. And the snow age will obviously be zero hours old because the snow is currently falling. So the next slide should show you the uh, half statute mile wind threshold five, or the five percent credibility uh, wind threshold in knots, and that ranges from about 16 knots across the north to about 15 knots across the south. And likewise, and then the 95 percent credibility wind threshold uh, then is 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 more, ranging from about 32 knots across the north to 37 knots across the south. And what that will give you then for probabilities uh, should be about 80 percent, uh, 75 to 80 percent across the majority of the forecast area, uh, taking uh, the inputs of temperature, wind speed, and snow amount into account. And then looking at the wind threshold, uh, so right now the no snow wind threshold 5 percent should be highlighted. And what that is then is the wind threshold that could produce blowing snow 
without taking the falling snow into account, and you'll notice those those values are are slightly higher. And then there's the next slide is the 95 percent uh, credibility, and you see those wind speeds are significantly higher. So once the snow comes to an end, we could probably expect that blowing snow will continue to be somewhat of an issue. Uh, the model is showing 40 to 50 percent uh, probability of half mile reduction in blowing snow. And what this will likely tell us is that, you know, in the more prone areas uh, that to get blowing snow, you probably will, will expect that blowing snow um, hazard to continue. A new case with light wind and heavy snow, and this is just to show you that when you do have heavy snow in the forecast that um, your probability will be 100%. So the winds are very light, uh, almost calm in this situation, uh, but your snow amount is going to be heavier, ranging from well, three inches or so across the north to five inches in that six hour period across the south. And that will give you uh, this visibility from just falling snow to about a half mile across the north to near zero across the southern forecast area. Here is that 5% credibility uh, wind threshold from those given inputs. And that will give you basically where it's less than a half mile visibility just from the falling snow will give you that 100% probability. So in this case, you know, as, although it is giving you the 100% probabilities, you're likely not going to put blowing snow in the forecast uh, because your wind thresholds that take out the falling snow are are significantly higher, and you have zero percent probability of blowing snow. And then one last case, and I'm almost done, is for heavier snow and stronger winds. So uh, your temperature will be the same, your snow amount will be the same as the last case, uh, but the winds are going to be increased just a little bit. And that will give you um, the same probability just because your snow is heavier across the southern forecast area, uh, but because we did increase those wind speeds a little bit, um, with falling snow, uh, you'll notice that, you know, where that visibility from snow is expected to be about a half mile. Uh, your probabilities that your, your visibility is going to be slightly less than a half mile do increase a little bit. <clears throat> so the next slide should say manually running the model. And if you don't want to run the NDFD script each time, uh, there is this populate procedure that I have available um, under populate and then blowing snow model. and. That uh, just brings up a GUI where you can select your start hour and end hour relative to zero Z. And, and if you do run it for, say, the four, full 72 or 84 hours of the short term forecast, uh, like I said, it will take about two minutes to run. And just some uh, brief tips from, from Dave Bagley and from Environment Canada uh, who have been. Um, attempting to utilize this model for the past five or seven years, I believe. Um, and obviously, each forecast office is going to take some experience to, to equate the probabilities to an actual forecast. Um, but generally, you're probably going to want to see some big numbers. Uh, if you see probabilities around 50 percent, uh, what they do is forecast blowing snow at times or, or just limited limit the blowing snow to the more vulnerable areas. Uh, if you're seeing higher probabilities in the 80 to 90 plus percent range, you're probably going to have more of a straight blowing snow forecast, but there's probably going to be um, some variability uh, through the period. And then if you have a chunk of solid 100 percent probabilities, um, it then is when you're probably going to see a period of unbroken quarter mile or, or less visibility that that would maybe equate to more of a, a blizzard situation. Uh, again, though, if you want to relax your blizzard definition a little bit and allow for some breaks, uh, you can reduce your uh, probability thresholds accordingly. And and like 
you know, like we said before, it's going to take some experience. We did have this operating last year here at FGF. However, we had very few blowing snow forecasts, so we really don't have any solid advice uh, to add to, to Environment Canada's advice uh, with this with this model. I'm going to skip over the calculation of snow age and go to just briefly some future plans that we could do for this model. Um, right now the snow age is calculated automatically and as you may have saw on the last slide it, it uses RTMA data. Uh, if, if there's no falling snow in the forecast then it reverts back to observational data and um, basically if, if the RTMA has any QPE 0 0.01 or greater with um, temperature 33 degrees or less, it's going to assume snow, which is not always the best situation. So I hope to allow for the user to modify that snow age grid uh, in the future. Uh, another future plan would be to incorporate a temperature index snowpack aging model. And David Bagley is going to provide us um, with that type of coding and then for me to code into GSB. It's just something we have not gotten around to yet. I'd also like to add some model probabilities. Currently only the forecast database is used and it may be beneficial to include uh, probabilities based on output from, from each model as well. And then another idea we had is to implement the uh, the NOH RSC data, um, which does get snowpack temperature, and we have recently just started pulling that data into GFC, um, which could be an additional uh, advantage to at least getting or knowing what the characteristic of the snowpack is um, currently, which sometimes is, is difficult to, to know. So here's just a, a slide should say simplified snowpack aging rate. And um, you know the snow be, the snowpack becomes becomes more dense and and that is accelerated by strong wind or liquid precipitation, but um, it's mostly affected by by the temperature. So you know if your snowpack is subject to 32 degree or greater temperatures uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, your your snowpack is going to become pretty dense pretty rapidly and eventually probably will be too dense uh, to blow around. And knowing uh, the snowpack density and trying to um, incorporate that into some type of modeling based on your forecasted temperatures I, in GFE I think would, would be beneficial to, to this blowing snow model as well. And then here is the next slide should say proposed snowpack aging model and that's just um, basically what the code that he will provide. So as your temperature increases, the snowpack density increases. As the temperature decreases, uh, that snowpack density may decrease a little bit as well with a little lag time obviously. And that should be Oh, and since the Badgers are going to the Rose Bowl, I have to include weather Bucky in my presentation as well. So that is all I have. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, anybody have any questions for uh, Tom? I guess I'd also like to add, um, if you want the coding, I kind of have it packaged up. I, um, I'm not quite an ITO and I don't put together very good tech orders, but um, I do have something packaged together with with limited instructions, but you would have to have some knowledge of GSE in, in order to install it. Have you actually made this into a tech order yet? Not a tech order, no. Just there's a I have a simplified, I guess, installation like Word document and a tar file that I sent to Aberdeen, I believe, but okay. they have not yet gotten around to installing it. Okay. Well, if you need to, you can talk to Matt Foster also here, and he would be able to help you with that. Okay, sounds good. Well, I'm sorry you didn't have more blowing snow cases last year. 
Uh, I have one question, and this is um, it's not direct. It's more for uh, not really blowing snow, but I know a lot of times where you get the more drifting snow and you get that real sheen on the uh, on the roads, and, and boy, it can get really slick fast um, with traffic on it. Uh, have they looked at anything like that, or was there anything you've looked at? Because I, I know there's cases where it's not really blowing, blowing, but it's more of a drifting snow. Yeah, they have not done any research into that, and I guess we have not really either. Um, hopefully with some experience, maybe I would guess that that would be possible with maybe the lower end probabilities that this model would give out. Um, where it, you know, the wind is enough to actually blow the snow, but it's not enough to actually lift the snow into the air to reduce visibility. Right, right. Okay. Hi, Tom. It's Carl in Des Moines. Can you hear me? Hello. Now? Yep, I can hear you. I do like the weather, Bucky, by the way. Um, <laughs> we wanted to have you review again what happens when temperature goes above freezing and you get melting or if it rains on it. Because, you know, here in Iowa, that's typical. We get our snows messed up and they're not pure and just kind of aging. They're melting and just thawing and refreezing. Right. Um, I guess what I understand from, from Dave up in Canada is when that happened, they threw out those observations. So those observations are not included uh, for for this type of a model. Okay, so that means I guess the probabilities would go down then if you had any kind of melting on the pack or anything like that. Yeah, the probabilities would be right, significantly less just because you do have that, you know, you melt, melt that top and then you freeze it and you know, the wind would need to be very strong in order to break that crust. And I, a lot depends on, on that top crust and how strong it is. Um, you know, we've had situations here up at FGF where we've had a very solid crust on top of the snowpack, but, you know, we're getting winds to 50, 60 miles per hour and it's able to break that crust and all of a sudden all heck breaks loose. Uh, but it does, you know, depending obviously on the strength of that top crust, but it does, it can, it can be broken and it can, you know, get to that more fluffy snow underneath then, but I guess as far as research as to how strong that wind needs to be, that is, I guess there is no research that I'm aware of. <laughs> but Tom, also, and you look at uh, if you've had like an extremely cold period, I mean, that does change the character of the snow too itself. So, even, even if it has a crust on it, let's say, but underneath, uh, it's quite a bit different. It's not like nice little crystals. <laughs> you know, after, or, after, yeah, or after you have the, you know, the snow itself, it definitely has changed. It has, yep. Yeah. And some of those nomograms attempt to, to assess that, that snow snowpack state. Um, it's not perfect. But, you know, there was another situation a few years ago where, you know, we had very heavy snow and 40, 50 mile per hour winds where the temperature was 33, 34 degrees. And we were calling around and there was, you know, everyone, yeah, we can see for 10 miles, we can see for 10 miles. So we, you know, obviously kept the winter storm warning and an hour after my shift left, the temperature dropped into the, 20s and the blizzard started where you know it just took that drop in temperature to change the the snow density on the ground and it was able to blow around them well like you said you can't just you know take it as just straight out you have to look at all the different uh, characteristics of yep, the snow it's a, yeah. another tool <laughs> right <laughs> Okay, any other questions for Bucky? I mean, uh, for Tom. <laughs> hey, Tommy, this is uh, Mike from Aberdeen. Hey, Mike. Hey, how's it going? Uh, good, good presentation. Uh, one question on the uh, winds. It just uses, the model uses just the uh, sustained winds, correct? Not the gusts? 
That is correct. Okay. And that is there's, some, else. there's some other papers out there I know that talk about the, you know, obviously it's the perturbation and the wind speeds as well that, you know, the gustiness is what helps loft snow. So he hasn't found uh, any correlation to that. Is that correct? You know, actually, if you read, if you go through the paper and you read it, um, he does calculate a bunch of CSI scores um, with, with using just sustained wind and just using wind gusts. Um, so I suppose that you know maybe it would be better for this model to use wind gusts. I'm not sure, uh, but he does. I got he has calculated different. Uh, nomograms for sustained wind and for for wind gusts as well. And I guess one other thing I'll add is he the CSI or the um, critical su success index uh, they calculate it to be about 66 percent, with about 95 percent POD and 31 percent false alarm rate. With uh, using the five percent credibility wind threshold. Okay, I think that makes sense. Maybe it's it's somewhat inherent in the model, where obviously as you get stronger sustained winds, theoretically you're probably having increased gustiness too. But that's not always the case. But and yeah, the other question is, did he look at no direction at all either, huh? In terms of um, no no direction, and um, that's one of the I guess. Uh, what am I trying to say here? That's one of the things where you have to kind of use all of the different blowing snow forecast techniques um, available to you, and the one would be climatology and and knowing which direction you know is more favorable for for blowing snow. Obviously, here we have a a flat with area with no trees at all, and you know as you get to our eastern forecast area, you have an area that more heavily forested and um, that area that's more heavily forested we're probably not going to forecast blowing snow for you know unless it's really certain where we're getting probabilities very high. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Yep. Uh, Tom, when we're done here, um, uh, would you be able to send me uh, the presentation? And do you have a digital copy of the paper? Because I can put that with the recording too, so everybody can get to it. Yep, I can do that. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, last call for questions, comments, observations. Okay, well, go Badgers for the Rose Bowl. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you again, Tom. We sure appreciate uh, you taking the time to put this together and present it today for us. Uh, it, it was it was really great information. Thank you. Yep, not a problem. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.